So this quote, Thomas Cranmer um, was a man who was put to death, um, who kind of betrayed his faith, uh, Englishman who betrayed his faith. Uh, he wrote the Book of Common Prayer, uh, but then actually repented of that. Um, I, I, he's a fascinating character in church history. Uh, he was burned at the stake, and it's, it's said that he felt like he had betrayed Jesus with his hand um, and in that giving loyalty to the king um, in spite of his convictions uh, rather than to his Lord. And so they said that he thrust his hand into the fire as he was burning and said, this should burn first for this was the first thing that betrayed Jesus. So just another kind of human being. We just, we can't really imagine that kind of uh, conviction. You're like, you're like, I'm gonna make sure that the body part that betrayed Jesus first is what suffers the most and the longest. And it's intense. Uh, but he has this incredible statement. I've always been haunted by this phrase because it works both for the faithful and the faithless. It works both for, the, for those who are surrendered to Jesus and those who are against Jesus. And that is what the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. And I want you to think that that's a very, it's kind of like a, it's a little bit of a mind bender. Like it's, uh, but the statement is, is very clear. We we worship what we love and what we love uh, is what we tend to pursue what we chase after and what we chase after our mind is ingenious at justifying that behavior <laughs> so you can see how that is a statement that works both for the godly and the ungodly and what i think it really reveals is that the human condition is a condition that is going somewhere uh, that we're a part as a, if I go back to the very first message in this series that we're a part of a grand narrative that our lives are telling a story and there is a trajectory in that story and we have the choice and, and when I say choice I am not making a commentary on free will for I like to say that um, when people ask me if I believe in free will I say I believe in limited free will that is even our freedom is within the boundaries of of a god who is over everything um, and we have zero freedom when it comes to our ability to reach god in our own effort um, and so that that word requires um, re requires further definition however jesus says whoever the son of man sets free shall be free indeed and so the freedom of the believer is the is a freedom that creates responsibility um, and there is a fragility in it as well, which means that at any given moment, we can, we can allow the heart to once again become romanced by things other than Jesus. And once the heart begins to fall in love with things other than Jesus, I mean, puts things above Jesus, what happens is that the will begins to chase those things. And once the will begins to chase it, we find ourselves in the trappings of, of either we can either repent or we will justify our behavior. <laughs> I mean, that's just, it seems to be just the reality of what it says in Scripture, that the heart is wicked and deceitful above all things and not to be trusted, which is why we as Christians need a new heart, which is what Jesus means when he says we must be born again. So, having said that, I want us to consider these parallel lines, and we're going to begin with the lineage of Cain. Um, and with the lineage of Cain, I want to focus in, and the lineage of Seth, I want to focus in on two names in the lineage that repeat. This is so fascinating, parallel lines. And I mean, literally, like these, there are doppelgangers. Uh, you guys know the, the myth of the doppelganger, right? Is that out there somewhere in the world, there is an exact replica of you, but they are the opposite of you. They're like through the looking glass. And so, so usually doppelganger is um, in fiction is considered a very bad thing to meet your doppelganger means that if you're a good if it's the good you you're going to meet the evil you um, at, or vice or if you're the evil you somewhere out there is the good you um, so that what's interesting about these lineage lines is there are literally it begins and ends both lines begin and end with doppelgangers uh, and the first time the name Enoch is mentioned is here uh, in the lineage of Cain. And it says in chapter 4, 
verses 16 through 18. It says, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, in the land of wandering, the land of nothingness, east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch, and he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Erad, and Erad begot Mahujal, and Mahujal begot Methushel, and Methushel begot Lamech. Now, we're going to stop right there because this is the birth of civilization. Cain goes out from the presence of the Lord. He is marked by the Lord as an act of mercy. God puts protection over him. But Cain's movement away from God, away from his family, is very symbolic of the natural descent of man. Uh, this is the birth, the beginning of what I refer to as man willfully walking away from God. He is the murderer whose rejection of God literally becomes the archetype of the godless, but also at the same time God-haunted. A people, humanity is marked by this reality. Godlessness, but at the same time God-haunted. A deep desire within the human heart that cannot be satisfied by the things of the world, and yet there is an insatiable appetite for the things of the world in our attempt to satisfy that longing. Um, and that is a, a mysterious reality. No person, it, I, I, I've never met someone uh, who uh, feels like, unless their pride is so outrageous that there's some kind of mental health issue that believes in their heart that they are the best possible version of themselves. Is there anyone here that believes they are the best possible? You're like, me, I'm like, you shouldn't raise your hand when I just said, unless you have mental illness. <laughs> no, none of us would raise our hand at that. Um, you might even be like pretty satisfied with who you are and, and your general ability, your organization, your, your, disciplined, uh, your disciplined existence. But what I have found is actually the most disciplined people that I know generally are the most unsatisfied with themselves and with others. And I'm not saying that is a knock on discipline because discipline is an essential aspect of building human character, but often it is the perfectionist temperament and perfectionist by nature always see room for improvement in themselves and in others. It's a gift and a curse. Um, just like the person who is perpetually distracted um, and interested in everything, that's a gift kind of can create the temperament of wonder, but it's also a curse and then the feeling that you never can get anything actually done. Uh, our tendency is toward extremes, is the, is the bottom line. Um, and that's all due to the fall. Everything we have, even the good, is mixture. Um, but what we have here is this incredible picture of the archetype of man beginning to chase after the two key desires are mentioned in this. He goes out of the presence of God and what's the first thing he does? He finds a wife and there is the fulfillment of, of human relationship but also the mark of sexual desire. And what is it really a mark of? It is that he has now moved toward this reality of longing for um, both life um, and belonging. So his movement toward his wife, I want to be a producer of life and I want to have a place to belong. I want to have the satisfaction of emotional connection, uh, which is kind of create the, the ultimate is that the, the, the marriage union, the, be able, the, the ability to pass on legacy, to create um, but also the desire to, to feel close to another, to have some kind of satisfaction um, and intimacy. But the real fascinating one for me is the, is the desire to create a place to belong to, which is the building of the city. And the son that he has is named Enoch. And the name Enoch 
um, its Hebrew meaning literally means dedicated. Dedicated. But what is this Enoch dedicated to? He is dedicated to the work of man. He is dedicated to what man can achieve apart from God. He is dedicated to man being his own God. He is the emblem of why the city will always be uh, personified by Babylon. By Babel. Which is the city of the great harlot. It is the city that is in opposition to all things, um, all things that are marked and controlled by Yahweh, by God. It is a city that is marked by chaos and violence, but it is also marked by the ingenuity of the human mind and the ability for human beings to come together and do extraordinary things. So never think for a second that sin leads humanity to an inability to create extraordinary things. No. <laughs> sin means we ex create extraordinary things without a connection to the Creator, which means that the extraordinary things that we create usually have um, diminishing returns and in ultimately the greatest inventions throughout human history have also at one, in one way may have blessed human history and another way may actually wreak even greater destruction to human history. Look at the 20th century. Look at the invention of Fritz Haber, who was the German chemist who was, won the Nobel Prize for pulling bread out of the air. Before, before the beginning of the 20th century, fertilizer was the great problem for human existence. The, re the reason the world's population was only 1.5 billion at the beginning of the 20th century is because there were so many countries where millions and millions and millions of people were starving to death because there was not enough fertilizer or the ability to fertilize and cause the land to grow things. Fritz Haber, fertilizer was actually created, um, was made from bones. It was very, it was rare things that created fertilizer and only the wealthiest countries could get it. And so what, what did they do? Fritz Haber as a chemist, he figures out how to draw it out of essentially hydrogen. Um, he, he, and I could be wrong on that. It could just be, he is a man who literally figured out, it has to do with, with oxygen and he figured out how to break those things apart and create a fertilizer that they say is the reason the world's population went from 1.5 billion to 7 billion by the end of the 20th century, which is insane. <laughs> but you know what else he created? He's the father of chemical warfare. He's the German Jew that unleashed chemical, uh, the um, chemical warfare in World War I that killed 10,000 Belgian soldiers and French soldiers in two days. It, can you imagine that kind of catastrophe? Hitler was in the troops on the German side and the wind blew the chemicals back onto the German troops and Hitler himself almost died from this ended up in the hospital from this. That's why he actually never used it on the battlefield in World War II. But you know where he did use Fritz Haber's ingenuity? What was the main ingredient in the gas chambers? Fertilizer. The very fertilizer that fed millions became the, the end game for Fritz Haber's own family. I tell you that story because I find it absolutely fascinating and disturbing at we have no idea every time we create some kind of major pro progress in civilization um, we do not seem to be evolving we seem to be devolving that everything that is meant to bring good and health to the world whether it's systems of government, whether it's new inventions, scientific discovery. We all know this uh, ourselves because we're the age where we, we live longer, we have more, but what is running rampant? I mean, our city streets are filled right now with zombies hooked on fentanyl. A, a drug that was created to remove pain is causing more pain and havoc in our society right now, in our city, probably than anything else. We're talking about houses and mental health 
and we're just ignoring the fact that probably the root of those mental health issues and the reason that there aren't homes is because these people's minds have been taken over by a combination, a lethal combination of methylamphenidate, which is an upper, combined with an opiate that's 60 times stronger. 60 times stronger than morphine. My son lost one of his dear friends, a boy that used to sleep at my house almost every weekend, to one fake Percocet. To have his own father step over his dead body three times in the morning before he realized his son was dead. The evils that come out of the progress of human civilization is something. We have found all kinds of ways to escape pain, but every single one of them have diminishing returns and seem to create more pain in the end. This is the nature of man's ingenuity apart from God, who alone holds the keys to life and death. I share these things with you because you can just keep going down the list. I mean, think about the ways, that, the, the, all the things that we do as a society. Like, I mean, we're, we're health obsessed in America. Um, and yet, we can't seem to escape. It's like, how, why can't half the people in this room eat bread in America? It's like the, you know, it's really. It's like some of you are like, I, I eat bread. Yeah, but there's a lot of people in here I know that don't, like, I can't do that. It's like you go to Europe and you can just feast on it. And here you get sick for a week. And you don't even know what's wrong. It's like, what, aren't we the country of, of, of much? Or are we... Also, the, I always people like, America is great. It's the greatest country ever in the history. And I'm like, man, I'm grateful for where I live. But let's not fool ourselves. Because for as great as America is, we also have given the world probably the worst things. Let me list a few of them. Porn. How about that one? You're like, oh, well, yeah. Uh, McDonald's. <laughs> it's evil because it is the best french fries in the world. It's true. At least when they're warm. And then they're evil when they're cold. They're like, it's weird how the transformation, they, they actually are a perfect illustration of what I mean. On the surface, very good. And then it gets cold and you see what it really is. And it's not good. It's not good. We, we, we gave the world the atomic bomb. You, what else? does one need to say after watching Oppenheimer and walking outside to see lines of people dressed up like the Barbie movie and I, I remember just feeling so inside overwhelmed and I just wanted to wear a sandwich board that just and run up and down and screaming we're all gonna die we're all gonna die um, it, but nobody cares because we're also the nation that is the masters of creating Endless means of escape to avoid the nagging voice of conscience. Isn't that true? I, I think it's interesting because we see the two pursuits here. Um, the pursuit of eternity, the pursuit of security, the search for both life and belonging. He knows his wife and he builds a city. This is a place of refuge where he can be himself. But the problem is it's him being himself apart from God, which is never a true self. And that creates what we have is the birth. This is the beginning, the place where paradise becomes a legend, if I could borrow from the words of Jacques Ellul, and creation becomes a myth. So Enoch, the first Enoch, a name it means dedicated to what man can achieve apart from God. And look what Cain's line goes on to produce. The, here we have the first Lamech. Then Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the second was Zillah. And Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of those who play the harp and flute. Notice this. Industry is coming through this line. Cain's line is fascinating. It's the creation of so many of the things that we love. <laughs> Musical instruments, entertainment, this comes through Cain's line. It's, it, wait till we get to the godly line because it's, it's, so, it's so interesting. Uh, he's the father of those who play the harp and flute. And by the way, 
is there anything wrong with the harp and flute? No. We see the harp and flute used um, in the temple worship. Uh, there, you know, there are Christian movements that are, have been known. You guys ever saw Footloose? You know, that's a great picture of the, the, the stereotypical church that refuses real music or dancing. <laughs> and, but you can't hold back a man who needs to dance off his frustration as Kevin Bacon proved to us um, in that glorious scene of him dancing in the barn. I've watched that many, many times. And I don't know why. It's because I was a kid who loved... I, was, I won first, first place as a break dancer in sixth grade. I, it's a real lifeline for me. But let me just tell you, Footloose is a lie because kids are not down with dancing in farming towns. Because I know, because I got the heck beat out of me like every week for like four years straight. Um, so, because I like to dance and sing uh, and it did not serve me well. Uh, this, through this line, the city becomes this place, this origin, music, entertainment, industry. Look what he goes on to say. She also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. See what man can do when they get together? See what the city creates is the possibility. I was a kid who grew up in rural America. All I wanted to do was live in the city. I was convinced I was born to the wrong family. I spent every weekend of, high, of my junior and senior year in, in Portland, Oregon, back in the day when there were underage clubs that we could come to on the weekends. And I would go dancing and I would stay with friends and just do drugs. And the city was the, the, it was the refuge from the small-mindedness of the town that I lived in. At least that was my, of course, you know, every kid thinks that every adult is stupid when you're a teenager. Uh, and, and just the escape, this, this backwards place that I lived. The city was the place of forward thinking. It was the place of, of innovation. It was the place of the, where the arts could thrive and you didn't have to feel, you could be, you could be okay being different. It fed all of those longings. But really, what was it feeding? The same longings that, that God is meant to satisfy. The longing for life and the longing for, for, a, for belonging. I found a place of belonging in the city because I found other people that felt like they didn't belong anywhere else. And this is what it becomes. But notice, as he becomes the craftsman of bronze and iron, what is that a picture of? What do they become the key ingredients in? weapons which means that Cain who is the father of murder is now produced a city in his image and the image becomes murderous look what it goes on to say then Lamech said to his wives Ada and Zillah hear my voice wives of Lamech listen to my speech for I have killed a man for wounding me even a young man for hurting me, if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Now, I want you to think about this because Lamech's already done something that hasn't been done. He introduces to the world what? Polygamy. He marries two women. The Genesis account says, and the man shall leave his mother and father and be united with his wife and the two shall become one. Never is there instruction from God. By the way, uh, people will say, um, there are those that have broken off from Christianity that say polygamy is something supported by God because Abraham had multiple wives, Solomon had multiple wives, David had multiple wives. What God tolerates and what God intended are very different things. And God is in the business of working with mixture. What the Bible gives us is not a picture of perfect men and women that love God doing everything right. What the Bible gives us is a God who works through very messed up individuals in spite of them. Which should be good news for all of the normal people like you and me who are very messed up. Uh, God is a God of grace. And He works through and has the ability. God is not responsible for the evil of humanity, but God does have the uncanny ability to take what we intend for evil and to bring good and to bring beauty out of it. That is a powerful reality in the Gospel. But here's what I think is interesting. Islamic now confesses a murder. 
and he confesses a murder, and then he immediately connects that murder to what he thinks God said to Cain. And this shows us the danger of, line- of, of how we pass down to our children ideas that move further and further away from the source until they are no longer, um, no longer an accurate depiction of what actually happened. Cain has departed from God, and now the city that is designed by Cain that has become an emblem of Cain's very nature, which is murder, is also turned into a misrepresentation of the heart of God. And because it is a place of selfishness and of um, uh, innovation as well as violence, the vision is if there is a God, He must be as cruel as we are. So, he says this, which is so interesting. Listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for wounding me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. In other words, he is misrepresenting God. He thinks that there is nothing but judgment for him. When, when God said they will be avenged sevenfold, that was actually a word of protection over, over Cain. Lamech is not viewing it as that. He is seeing it as, as a word of judgment because he doesn't know God and so he misrepresents his character. It's a perversion, actually, of what God was providing in His mercy protection for a murderer And instead, Lamech now sees God as the one who is the truly dangerous murderer because he doesn't know Him. He's speaking in hyperbolic. He uses the 77. A multiple of seven is hyperbolic, emphasizing the extreme severity of the vengeance envisioned by Him. So this is Cain's line. This This is modern man. And this is civilization. But what about the godly line? Well, the godly line, first of all, we're not, I'm not going to read the whole lineage of Adam. You can read it for yourself, um, which takes place in chapter 5. But I want to just focus in um, on a couple things. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 25 to 26, we switch back to Adam. And last we left them is that their son Abel has been killed by their other son Cain. And so we've been just given the line of Cain, which by the way, that line ultimately experiences total destruction and loss um, in the flood. There is a decreation that happens through Cain's line and ultimately ends up in a global judgment. But here we're told Adam, we come back to Adam and God fulfilling His promise that through the seed of the woman, He will bring redemption to the world. It says, And Adam knew his wife again. Knew is always always a a way of saying that he had sexual relationships with her, which also shows the dignity of sex in the Scripture, which is that it's about knowing someone, not using someone physically. Um, I think it's always important to point that out. Um, And she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. That is the significant line. Now it's going to move into Adam's lineage. Now here's the fascinating thing with Adam's lineage. Other than the fact that they live ridiculously long amounts of time, like 500 years, 600 years, 700 years. It's just like so-and-so lived... They don't seem to do anything. Like Cain's line, they're like the ones doing everything that I care about. Musical instruments, making cool things, figuring out how to make a living, building cities. And then you get to the godly line, you're like, and -and so-and-so lived 800 boring years of nothingness. And then the next person. I mean, that's how it, when when I read it, I just get bored even reading. I'm like tired by the time I get to the end of chapter five. Because they're just, I'm like, just give me something. Give me anything. And then you get something. And I'm going to say why in just a second, why I think there's nothing attached to their names. Um, But we get to chapter 5, verse 19. After a long list of 
so and so is 800 years, and then all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And then it's like, but God, Enosh, and Enosh, blah, 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 700, blah, blah, and you just get down. Then 19 to 24. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. And Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, this is so fascinating, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. In other words, Enoch did not see death because God took him. There are only two people in Scripture that didn't taste death the way that we have tasted death. And that is Elijah and Enoch. I've always been convinced if we're going to be at all literalist in, um, in our readings of Revelation, or at least, at least somewhat literalist, that maybe they're the two witnesses. Because it just seems like if God Himself doesn't escape death, um, that these two guys shouldn't like, get a free pass. I don't know, but uh, that's just my own thoughts. Like, they've got to die somehow, but maybe they don't. All I know is that God took him. And the point is, is that you have this entire lineage and you get to Enoch, a name that means what? Dedicated. And Enoch, unlike the Enoch that born to Cain, who is dedicated to life apart from God, dedicated to man's ability apart from God, dedicated to walking in the ways of godless humanity, this Enoch is dedicated to God. And while the first Enoch and the line of Cain ends in ultimate literal extinction and total destruction, their progress is actually the means that will usher in ultimate death because we're going to see that God saw that there was wickedness over the whole land. And by the way, it wasn't just Cain's line because there's a lot of people born here to, the, to Seth's lineage uh, and there's only one family that ultimately gets on that boat because nobody believed Noah. Um, so I, I think that, that it's foolish. we can't create true black and white like these guys are bad, these guys are good. That's not the picture that was painted here. But there is parallel lines here. And what you have through the godly line is you get to Enoch and you have a man who does not see death. Why? What does it mean to walk with God? Walk in Scripture, to walk in the Spirit, or walk in Jesus Christ, is to speak its relational language. If the line of Cain is the rise of the individual, the line of Seth in uh, the rise of independence. The rise of the godly line is a picture of total dependence upon God for life and a picture of intimacy. It's a picture of restoration of relationship. This is what happens when we call upon the name of God is that it actually brings us back into relationship with Him when we see, I need you. God is waiting for us to accept His gracious invitation to know Him through His Son. He says, just come to Me. What does Jesus say? Come to Me, all you who are weary. Weary of what? Weary of all the attempts to bring satisfaction to your life through your own effort. Just come to Me. I love you. This is why I tell you every week that on your worst day, Jesus is crazy about you. He loves you. He loves you. And the hardest thing for us, the hardest thing for us to accept in our individualistic age is that we need help. And that is why I always say if the church only functioned a little more like an AA meeting, we might actually start getting somewhere. Because the whole purpose of AA is to say, I can't fix myself. I need help. I need to be able to be honest about my brokenness. And I need to be able to be honest about it in a community that doesn't judge me, but actually helps carry that burden so that I can know that what I long for, like everyone, longs for is that I am loved and that I am known and that I have the ability to know. This is the invitation of Jesus. And the picture of Enoch is that a man who knows God is a man who has the ability to enter into 
the difficulty of life with a lightness of touch. His is the ultimate lightness. He somehow escapes death. I believe this. It's the picture of the spiritual death or what I call the good death of the New Testament. Is that unless one be born again, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. This is why the Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And this is the picture, is that the life of Christ, the saving life of Christ, means that the life that He lived qualified Him for the death that He died. And the death that He died qualifies us today for the life that He lived. And the beauty of that reality is this, is that Enoch was so surrendered to God that he already tasted the good death. Death is defeated by his by his beautiful intimacy. There's so much mystery around Enoch. We don't know really any other detail than what is given here. But I think the picture is this, is that the key to life is what? Dying to the lie of what God never intended so that you can come alive and become the person that God intended you or created you to be. So beautiful. Enoch is a man dedicated to walking with God. And I just ask the question, it's not, Enoch isn't perfect. It doesn't say that he was sinless. It just says that he walked with God. It means that he walked in the light. And to walk in the light is not to be without problems. To walk in the light is to be open to being exposed and trusting that you're covered. <laughs> That's the beauty of walking in the light. That's why I'm so honest about my own brokenness from the pulpit. Why I always tell you that no matter what I'm doing, even in the power of the Spirit, there is still sin involved. And, but the difference between a saint and one who is not yet called a saint is a saint is just a sinner who's cried mercy. I give. <laughs> you win, Jesus. You always do. <laughs> I've hit the bottom. There's nowhere for me to go but up. I'm going to grab a hold of the hand that's out to me. I'm willing to accept the help. Christians need to learn how to develop the discipline of receiving. I promise you it's easier to give than it is to receive. Because receiving requires a humility um, that is very challenging in an individualistic age that does not pride humility, but lifts up pride. <laughs> um, and this is a problem. Finally, we close with the second Lamech. And it says in Genesis 5, 25-29, Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech, and he begot Lamech. Methuselah lived seven, after he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. And Lamech lived 182 years, and he had a son, and he called his name what? Noah. Saying, this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. Now I want you to notice the difference between the first Lamech and the second Lamech. There's a tremendous amount of controversy and speculation around the etymology of the name Lamech. Um, but most Hebrew scholars agree that it's connected to the word low. Um, we don't know for sure because there's no equivalent word in the Hebrew Bible for it. Um, but it, but it, is the, it, it, it is a word that most agree that it means low. But it also can mean strength. So this is super interesting. So the first Lamech is, reveals the poverty of strength. And what I mean by that is he is brought low um, by his pride. So his name could mean strength. It could mean low. Both are accomplished in the name. The second Lamech shows us the hope that is found in humility. Lamech, this Lamech casts his hope not upon his own effort, not upon his own strength, not upon his own ability, but he sees his son as a conduit of God's provision. There is a humility, a comfort, that is found in being low. He recognizes who he is. He recognizes that he is a participant in the whole reason the ground has been 
cursed and the best he can do is cast his hope upon the living God and he sees the hope of God in his son who becomes a, a, a type if you will of Jesus he becomes a, a salvation if you will for humanity um, for it is through Noah that God will preserve the human race and I love this contrast isn't it are not the the writers of the Hebrew Bible brilliant in the little details how many of you like me didn't even notice that there were two Enochs and two Lamechs I mean it's just one of those things because you read through a lineage and you're like you're not like they're such foreign words but their significance even the names mean something and give us insight into the text and both lines are parallel lines and those parallel lines run through human history there has always been a remnant in the human population that still call out on the name of the Lord. Scripture declares, if we confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. No front loading, no back loading. You're like, but what do I do? You say yes to His yes. That's what you do. And you're like, well, that's, that's too easy. Oh, is it? Is it easy to say yes to Him and no to yourself? I don't think it's that easy. I think it's a yes that needs to be repeated every day. Not that I think our salvation can be lost, but I do think our sense of security can be lost because of our tendency to go back to chasing after, as I shared in that first quote, the chasing after the wrong loves, <laughs> um, which the will then chooses and the mind justifies. We need to consistently come back. This is why the key to the victorious Christian life it begins with just accepting Jesus. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, that's where it starts. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. God, enter, Creator, enters into His creation and becomes creature. He entered, God became a human being for us. And He lived the perfect life as a human being for us. And He died as a human being for us and he's resurrected as a human being for us and he ascended to the right hand of the father and will be a human being for all of eternity for us why because he's also totally god and you're like how yes i don't know nobody knows but that's what the gospel declares and it's the only thing that actually makes sense of the insanity of our world <laughs> And if you don't have that kind of conviction, you don't need to be able to explain atonement to people um, to help them understand that they're lost and that their desire to belong and to be known is possible in Jesus. And this is why our testimony as a church is to proclaim to a world that is still building cities to identify its potential apart from God that we are put here as little outposts in the midst of these Babylons and that is what Portland is. By the way, I don't believe that you can save the city, but I do believe that we can see a revival in a city because God's goal is not to save cities. His goal is to save people. And I want to be a part of that salvation. So if you don't know Jesus, put your trust in Him. He loves you. He lived life for you that you couldn't live and He died for you. And death could not keep Him because He's the author of life. But those of you who know Jesus, you need to really ask yourself, what is my heart chasing after? Is my life aligning with the, the lineage? You're like, but they didn't have anything. They didn't do anything. They just lived a long time. I don't want to live forever and not do anything. That's what it seems like they're doing. No, the reason there's nothing to say about the line that calls after God is because they are known for God, not for their own personal goals and ambitions. doesn't mean that they didn't have any. It's just not what they're, that's not what was recorded. What's remembered about them is that they begin to call upon the name of the Lord again. And I can say with absolute certainty, that's the greatest thing you could ever be remembered for. Do you know him? Which line is your life running in right now? What history are you a part of? If you're like me, you're a part of both, which is even more why we need to just cry out to Jesus, have mercy on me, Lord. Thank you for your goodness and your love in spite of me. Amen?